Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Scotland. This is the burn season. And normally at this time of year, from Moscow to Michigan, Cape Horn to Cape Hope, devotees of the National Bard are gathering together to celebrate the life and works of Scotland's greatest poet, Robert Burns. This year, the celebrations are virtual. There will be lost in camaraderie, no doubt will be made up for the international reach of the, the speakers and the guests. Today, to celebrate the season, we look at the life and times of another great Scot, and keen Burnsian, the socialist firebrand, Jimmy Reid. We speak to the author of a, an upcoming book on the working class hero some 10 years after his death. And we spear to our honest men and bonny lassies, despite the rain and they do Jimmy Reid's well-kent pairs, a Rabbi Burns. But first it is Mina, where you tweet your emails and your messages. O Taz, O Taz, I'll get thy fern. In hell, though, Roasty, like a hern. Well, there's been a tremendous online discussion in relation to our show last week, featuring top Tory commentator Peter Oborn and Professor Richard Murphy, where, amongst other things, we discussed the contribution of Marcus Rashford to political debate. To which Stephen says, Marcus Rashford is young enough to still remember vividly his mum's struggle. Not coming from political elite, he cannot be accused, as non-Tory party members are, of playing politics. Andrew Northall says, An absolutely brutal and devastating critique of Chancellor Rishi Sunak's entire understanding and response to the whole COVID-19 crisis by Peter Oborn. We also discussed the current political leadership of the Labour Party, to which Isabel tweeted, Jeremy Corbyn is superior in all ways to Starmer. Willie Lordy says, Sir Keir Starmer has made the Labour Party more credible what? More credible to who? Beatrice said, how could a sir defend Labour class problems? Rosemary says, Labour has no chance in Scotland until they back independence. And finally, Margaret Black says, really enjoying your show, Alex. Gives a real insight into what's happening in politics south of the border. Very interesting times we live in, don't we just? And now to a perspective on the life of Jimmy Reid. The man who led the workers of the cry to historic victory almost half a century ago. Although never elected to Parliament, Jimmy Reid was the most influential and famous Scottish socialist of his era. The best MP Scotland never had. Alex is in conversation with the author and journalist Brian McGeechan in relation to a new book. Brian McGeechan, you, you've called your new book on Jimmy Reid, Jimmy Reid Walking with History. Why that title? I think Alex it certainly sums up Jimmy, a man who walked with history. These pivotal figures in uh, post-war 20th century, he knew them. He became a figure of great significance on his own. Now, these were two series of interviews, some 20 years apart, which is, which is fascinating. And the first set of interviews was in the, the early 1990s, am I correct? Yes, that's right. 1994, I uh, had worked with Jimmy on his magazine, Seven Days, and uh, it was very nonchalant about the project in the sense that he said, typical Jimmy word, you know, you, you want to talk about things, son, come up. That's how it began. Then uh, resumed in 2008 when he had retired to Butte. So it was a much more reflective Jimmy at that point, I would say. Now, of course, Jimmy Reid was a incredibly well-read man, I mean, uh, self-taught in the main. Uh, and as you say, he had known some of the great towering figures of the, of the 20th century. I mean, I know that one of his great friends was, was Paul Robeson, the, the, the great American bass singer and civil rights activist. What did, what did Jimmy tell you about Paul Robeson? Well, he'd uh, helped Paul Robeson Jr. on a passport problem when Jimmy was working for the Communist Party in London in the 1960s. And uh, at a function with his wife, Joan, uh, he was approached by Paul Robson himself, who says, I want to speak to Jimmy Reid. Paul Robson sought Jimmy out and thanked him profusely for helping his son. So it was quite an experience. And he got to know Paul Robson and, and considered him quite such an admirable man. Because Paul Robson was... Uh the towering figure of the civil rights movement before Martin uh, Luther King, persecuted during the McCarthy period, but also one of the greatest singers uh, in the world. But he had a particular affection for Scotland, didn't he, Paul Robson? Yes, he did. Jimmy would talk about 
Paul Robson performed in Glasgow uh, to the Scottish audiences, and of course, Hebridean songs, Burns songs, uh, the Ballad of Joe Hill. The Scots loved him, of course, and just fell in love with that voice and uh, his activism, obviously. Now, Jimmy Reid went on a political journey from the Communist Party uh, through the Labour Party, uh, eventually joined the, the Scottish National Party. Indeed, I, I signed him up. Uh, did any of your conversations with Jimmy reflect that, that political journey? Yes, very much so. From uh, 1994, as you know, the New Labour project took hold and that began a process for Jimmy of disenfranchisement from the, the, the Labour Party. Always, as you say, a Labour movement man, but he had become progressively convinced at that point that he would stay in the Labour Party only to see a Scottish Parliament take place, which he'd fought all his adult life for and campaigned for. With that Parliament being achieved, he then understood that more powers should come to the Parliament. And finally, when he joined the SNP, he believed that Scotland should be an independent country and that we should take a place amongst the nations of Europe. Now, the two greatest... Uh things that Jimmy Reid is remembered for, perhaps, are the, the UCS work-in, the Upper Clyde Shipbuilders work-in of almost 50 years ago, uh, and then this uh, amazing rectorial address when he was elected rector of Glasgow University. Tell us first about what Jimmy told you about the, the inside story of UCS. Jimmy strategised a new concept, which was a work-in. They weren't going to strike, they weren't going to sit in, they would continue to build the ships. And when Jimmy walked onto the platform at John Brown's and made that incredible, impromptu rallying call, well, as you know, it sent a, a current through the crowd. We are taking over these yards because we refuse to accept that faceless men will devastate our livelihoods with impunity. Even today, when you read the words or hear Jimmy speak them, it's absolutely mesmerising. And then, of course, the rectorial address at Glasgow University, the, the, the rat race is for rats, not for human beings. I mean, that had a resonance internationally, did it not? Yes, absolutely. It, uh, it was reprinted in the New York Times, uh, and Jimmy in the book reveals how that came to be. The op-ed uh, editor in the New York Times, Herbert McGang, he was an authority, of course, on... Abraham Lincoln had written many books on Lincoln in a stage play. So when Mick Gang called it the greatest speech in Skettysburg, it was an authority who was, was saying this. And of course, to this day, a rat race is for rats. We're not rats for human beings. It's such a powerful resonance through the ages. I'm wondering, Brian McGeehan, will, will we ever see the likes of Jimmy Reid again in the sense he was a, a self-taught, self-educated working-class hero. The days of heavy industry are almost behind us. Will we ever see someone like that again? I think it's highly unlikely, Alex. Uh, someone of Jimmy's intellect, self-taught, a voracious reader all his life, and as a young man, highly, very inspired by people who were active in his community. I think that Jimmy was, without doubt, a singular figure, a unique figure. Highly unlikely that we'll ever see his light again. And of course, when Jimmy Reid became a celebrity, as he did after UCS and uh, television and uh, newspaper columns, I think people were pretty well astounded. I'm sure some of the, the dons at Glasgow University were taken aback by the learned nature of his rectorial address. And I know that Kenneth Williams was certainly taken aback in the Parkinson show when he found out that this working class guy seemed better read than he was. Yes, absolutely. I think that people perhaps expected from Jimmy a highly political speech which would not encompass the elements it did, which were humanity, elements of Christianity, an appeal across the board, which meant that the, the dons in Glasgow University, along with the press gallery, rose to their feet and acclaimed them. And I think it surprised a lot of people particularly someone like Kenneth Williams, who didn't expect Jimmy to quote Shelley's Mask of Anarchy and, and talk in a way which uh, certainly left him on the ropes. 
I think people who watch this now on YouTube, they realise that, that Jimmy delivered a few knockout punches through his intellect, which was considerable. Well, Billy Connor did say J Jimmy Reed spoke sentences that knocked you back three steps. Now, I should say, Brian, in the interest of transparency, that you've asked me to do a foreword for the book, so I've had a unique insight. And I, and I know you, you have this unique family photo library that Aileen Reed, uh, one of Jimmy's daughters, is, uh, is contributing to the book. Will that give us a, an insight into the, the man behind the legend? Yes, absolutely. Um, it was very photogenic. There's quite a few paintings of Jimmy also. And... Uh, the archive from Eileen is, has been absolutely tremendous and uh, gives a private insight to him as he was at home, watching the football, smoking a cigar, enjoying the conviviality of life, which he always did. I mean, I have treasured photos of myself with him in the, at the Jazz Festival at Butte, where he drew a crowd more than any of the musicians because people wanted to meet Jimmy Reed, shake his hand, and the fact that they did so in such a convivial setting, it summed up Jimmy perfectly, as do the photos, which is tremendous. And one last question, Brian McGeehan, given the, given the season, I know that, that Jimmy was one of the many great figures in the world who were inspired by, by Robert Burns. And if I'm right, he summed up the rectorial address speech with a quotation from Burns. Yes, that's correct. He, he greatly admired Burns as a poet and a man. Um, he believed that Burns exemplified the morality of a man who cared for all human life. Um, Jimmy had the heart of a poet, and he endorsed Hugh McDermott's conviction that Burns needed no mawkish sentimentality, but was a strong, idealistic writer. His father, Leo, kept a, a well-thumbed compendium of Burns on his mantelpiece, and that book still lies in Jimmy's bookshelves in the Butte. So there was no question that when he had finished his to the force of a rhetorical address that, that Burns would be mentioned in there. Why don't you just recite the last lines from the rhetorical address yes. to finish off the interview? And why we should idly waste our time. The golden age will then revive, each man will be a brother. In harmony we all shall live and share the earth together. In virtue trained, enlightened youth shall love each fellow creature. And time shall surely prove the truth that man is good by nature. Brian McGeehan, thank you very much for, for joining me in the Alex Salmon Show and, and sharing your experiences of Jimmy Reid and Robert Burns. Thank you very much, Alex. Stay tuned, because coming up after the break, Alex is joined by broadcaster and author of Scots the Mither Tongue, Billy Kay, and the wonderful singer, Sheena Wellington. We'll see you then. Welcome back. In this season of Rabbi Burns, we're reviewing the life and work of working class hero, Jimmy Reed. Alex speaks to author and broadcaster Billy Kay and asks him to recite some of Jimmy Reed's favourite Burns poems, addressed to the Anka Gid and one of his shortest, Thanksgiving for a National Victory. Billy Kay, let, let's start this celebration of the lives of Jimmy Reed and Robert Burns by looking at some of the the favourite parts of, uh, of Burns that uh, Jimmy Reid liked so much. I mean, this uh, Thanksgiving for a national victory, what's that poem about? Well, it's about, <laughs> it's about Burns being quite radical in support, I think, of the French Revolution and the war that Britain was fighting against the French revolutionaries at the time. And he had a number of these, and that got him into a lot of trouble. So he also wrote at times poetry that would cover his back and make sure he wasn't sent to the penal colony in Australia or, or murdered or assassinated, which happened to the radicals in 1820, a couple of, a couple of decades later. But in this wee poem, he says, Ye hypocrites, are these your pranks to murder men and ye god thanks? Desist for shame, proceed no further. God won't accept your thanks for murder. So it's a very, very strong and striking poem. He was famous for singing Sa Ira, the French revolutionary song in the Globe Theatre in Dumfries. And then he had to really watch his back after the, the authorities had, had their eye on him. Yes, they're very powerful lines indeed. And I, I well remember Jimmy Reid mobilising them in his opposition to the uh, Iraq war in his... Uh, 
in his newspaper columns. But how about this other poem that was uh, mentioned in, the, in Jimmy's memoirs, uh, addressed to the Uncle Gid. What's that about, bearing in mind it's an international audience? The Uncle Gid are the extremely, <laughs> the extremely good. My mother referred to people that she wasn't very fond of in Goston, where I grew up, as the Uncle Gid. Folk that are pretentious and put it on a wee bit, and are not really genuine in anything they do. And Burns wrote a poem addressed to the Uncle Gid, the extremely good. And it begins with the general, O ye poarsi, gid yourself, say pious and say holy. You have nought to do but mark and tell your neighbour's thoughts and folly. And then he goes on to the particular, and one section is about Uncle Gid, a grand dame, you could say. Ye high exalted virtuous dames, tied up in godly laces, afore ye ye pair frailty names, suppose a change of cases, a dear loved lad, convenience, snug, a treacherous inclination, but let me whisper in your lug your ablins nae temptation, then gently scan your brother man, still gentler sister woman, though they may gang a ken and rang to step aside as human, one point must still be greatly dark, the moving why they do it, and just as lamely can ye mark who far, perhaps, they rue it. So as Burns celebrating human frailty, uh, human fa failings, but at the same time despising people who had failings but wouldn't admit they had failings. I think that's what it's about. And yet if you take one of uh, Robert Burns' greatest work, Tam Ashanta, in the middle of a a rollicking ghost story in Broad Scots, he suddenly inserts uh, uh, an English verse, where pleasures are like poppy spread. Well, what was he doing there? I mean, why was he going from Scots to English in the, in the middle of his epic poem? Those lines, although they're, they can read in English, they can be read in Scots too, but pleasures are like pleasure spread, etc. So, he was aware of the difference, and he used both languages to have to, to have effect. And he was gifted in both languages, but I wouldn't maintain that his best work by far uh, was in his native Scots. You don't think there was a, a bit of showing off there, that uh, what Burns was actually saying is, listen, I could write in English if I wanted, but I choose to write in Scots his mother tongue. I think there's an element of that. And uh, in other ones where uh, a poem, a Dinah, Scotia's Darling Seat, which is definitely not one of his best poems, he postured to the audience. And the audience was very, very concerned with uh, Augustan propriety at the time. And he could do it. I mean, he would read The Spectator. He would be up on Shenston and Pope and people like that. But... I would say in his heart, there's a great line actually that I could I could quote, which sums up Burns' attitude and how important the heart rather than the head was to him. And uh, I came across it when I did an interview with uh, Winnie Ewing, and she tells a story of having a drink possible. with Sir Alec Douglas Hume, ex-Prime Minister and father of British Unionism at the time, and they were heading for a Burns supper. And Alec Douglas Hume, to Winnie's astonishment, told Winnie that in his heart he was a Scottish nationalist, but his head told him otherwise. And Winnie said, well, you know what Robert Burns would have said to you, Alec? Nay treasures nor pleasures could make us happy lang. The hurt eyes the paired eye that marks us richt or rang. Brilliant reply. And uh, I always say that if somebody like Sir Alec Douglas Shuman in his heart was a Scottish nationalist, then everybody's up for converting as far as I'm concerned. Now, we've heard how Jimmy Reid uh, was inspired by uh, Burns's poetry. How about the other great uh, historical figures, politicians, campaigners we, we know have uh, found in Burns the inspiration to, to carry on their work? And among the people influenced by Burns were Abraham Lincoln, the great American president. He was invited to deliver the immortal memory at a Burns supper, I think it was in Chicago, and he refused, saying that nothing he could say could add to the eloquence of Burns himself. And considering they wrote the Gettysburg Address, that's some statement. He had 
friends growing up in Illinois in his 20s who were Scots and who were Burnsians and who taught him to recite Burns off by heart. It's famously, Abraham Lincoln could recite Robert Burns's poetry in Scots off by heart. Someone else from the States was uh, Frederick Douglass, the great African-American leader. When he came to Scotland to preach against slavery, he visited uh, Burns's cottage. He later met Burns's sister and he quoted Burns, especially songs like A Man's A Man For All That, the great egalitarian songs of Robert Burns. And of course, later on, Maya Angelou is a great fan of Burns and mentions uh, his influence on her. So there's a lot of great American writers were, were influenced uh, by, by Robert Burns. A favourite line from Burns himself? Burns's songs and poetry were just part of my culture growing up. Uh, my father played in the Barabon and the Brass Bond and played songs, tunes like A Man's A Man For All That. My sister was a good Burns singer. At family get-togethers, would sing Burns and then would sing the Beatles. They were part of popular culture at the time. So I really grew up with Burns. So it's hard for me to choose any poem as my favourite. But because it's Ayrshire Connections, and like Burns, I was born in Kyle, I always think of this as an Ayrshire anthem. War the earths, the wind can blow. I dearly like the West. For there, the bonny lassie lives, the last that I do best. There, wild woods grow and rivers row and money's the hell atween. But day and nicht, my fancy's flecked, is ever with my gene. Billy Kay, broadcaster, author of Scots, the mother tongue, and Burnsian, thank you for joining us again on the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you. This year, international celebrations of Rabbi Burns are taking place in cyberspace online. Fitting, really, given that 10 years ago, astronaut Nick Patrick took a miniaturised volume of the Bard's poetry up to the International Space Station. Alex speaks to legendary singer Sheena Wellington, someone who's been involved in many of the online Burns extravaganzas this year. Now, Sheena Wellington, and, and, and that historic moment when you sang at the opening of the, the Scots Parliament back in 1999. It was Robert Burns you sang. Was that your choice or the, the Parliament's choice? It was actually, I believe, the choice of either a civil servant or Shona Irvin, who at that time was the... or possibly Shona Reid, who was on the panel. And they decided that A Man's A Man For All That was a good song and it was better if it was sung by a woman. So I got the... Honor. But of course, Sheila, uh, in your career, you've uh, you've done uh, you must have done more burn suppers than uh, than I've had hot dinners. Uh, but this year, of course, very different because th th there are can't be for obvious reasons because of pandemic reasons there can't be any uh, of the camaraderie that we normally get in burn suppers. So you must be doing them in the the virtual world. How are you getting on with virtual burn suppers? They're actually quite good and funnily enough I'm doing more this year than I've done for the last several years because I've been wanting to say if I can't get home the same night I'm, I'm no going, you know. <laughs> but uh, this time I've sung for people across the world. Uh, last night it was Canada, Australia, um, various parts of Europe. I did a wonderful one for the Federation of Scottish Writers. That had people from everywhere and it was, it was amazing. And if all the, the library of, of Burns' uh, songs, is there one that is most uh, commonly called for when you, when you go to Burns' Supper or when you get to requests or, or do you stick to your, your own repertoire? But what is the, the popular demand? Which is the Burns' love song that's, uh, that's most wanted? The love song is either My Love's Like a Red, Red Rose or A Fond Kiss. Of course, the one that's most often requested is a man's a man for all that. And of course, uh, I think I'm right in saying that it was Bob Dylan who said my love is like a red, red rose was his uh, greatest poetic inspiration. So if it was good enough for Bob Dylan, good enough for Sheena Wellington, should be good enough for the rest of us. I think that's true and I'm, I, I love singing it. The, 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 the people that Burns inspired and continue to inspire, I mean, even... The, that wonderful young lass that did the 
poem at the inauguration last week was inspired by Maya Angelou, who was a huge devotee of Robert Burns. And wherever you go, wherever I've gone in the world, there have been experts on Robert Burns of all nationalities, creeds and colours. And it's amazing what a poet from Ayrshire has managed to do. Sheena Wellington, legendary Scots singer, thank you so much for joining us again on the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much for asking me, and have a great Burns season. For such a commanding and influential figure of the left, comparatively little has been written about Jimmy Reid. There have been two biographies, one from the SNP MP Kenny McCaskill, A Scottish Political Journey, and more recently from Knox and McKinley, A Clyde-Built Man. Luckily for us, the man himself was never done with writing, and that has given us a substantial record, and it's that which makes this new book all the more exciting. It gives us a series of interviews 20 years apart at crucial times in the development of uh, Scottish politics and lets us see Jimmy Reid in his own words. In addition, the, the Family Photo Archive will give us a unique insight into the, the man behind the legend, the, the lover of literature, of poetry, and of course the uh, the songs of Robert Burns. So what better way to play us out than hear the bard's namesake Ryan Burns singing perhaps the greatest love song of all time, Aphon Kiss. But in the meantime, from Taz, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye for now, stay safe, and we'll see you again next week. Star of